Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 245 for Tuesday, February 25th, 2020. Greetings, folks, and welcome back to Gig Gab, or welcome to Gig Gab, if it's your first time listening. We're the show for, by, and about working musicians, and here, back here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in San Jose, California, it's Paul Kent. <sighs> so I was in Mexico all weekend, Paul. I saw the pictures, man. It looks like you had a terrible time. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was just awful, standing out in the sun and the the you know watching a great band play four shows. We went and saw Fish at... Uh, Actually, at a, at a new resort for them, they've done this a few times, uh, but this this time they moved the the whole thing where they they have everybody stay at this one resort and then they set up a big stage on the beach. And it's it's the same company that's now CID Entertainment uh, puts all this together and they're the same company that does Dave, Dave Matthews and Tim Reynolds on the beach, same beach. Uh, Dead and Company did one and Luke Bryan does one. So they, they put together this thing and they, it's a great business model. I'm sure. Innov- yeah. Fortune. Innovation in, in live music is really cool. You know, they go and buy all the rooms in advance and then resell the rooms at like, yeah. at, but, but they resell them to, to us for like triple what I could buy the room for. And they're buying, you know, 2000 rooms a year in advance so i can how many only, people go to the shows uh about five thousand people can fit in the venue so that's what they sell uh um, and um any uh like access to the acts do you, are there meet and greets or anything like that nope nope it's just uh packages you can buy that are meet and greets or anything nope. like that not 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 for fish uh no i, I don't th- and i don't think for the others either I think it's just, you know, no, you, you can you can buy packages for different rooms. But once you get into the venue, everybody is basically equal. So, okay. yeah. Yeah. But I um, I, 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 I watched something I, I if you had asked me a week ago that I don't think I would have ever seen. And that was I watched Trey Anastasio play what what I think are some of his first gigs with in-ear monitors. He has professed he is he they tried them years ago with fish and he just couldn't stand them and he's he's said you know derogatory things about them in the past it's it's, it's sort of not not derogatory but like ah oh, yeah, those things they're vile you know I, I don't know i can't make them work like i've seen them in interviews and stuff and um and so the whole band hasn't used them but i know the other guys at least the keyboard player and the bass player uh use them in their solo projects so i know that those guys are comfortable with them but uh, this weekend was the first time I'd ever seen Trey wear them. Uh, it's possible that the shows he did in Denver just prior to this weekend uh, with a band called Oysterhead, which is him, Les Claypool from Primus and Stuart Copeland from the police. Uh, it's possible he used them there, but I've never seen him do it at a fish show before. And I have to give him a lot of credit. They were bothering the heck out of him. I, you know, like. I noticed it in the first show where I saw him. How like, did you notice? Well, he he was like playing or singing and he put his hand to his ear doing that obvious motion of pushing the in-ear back in and getting it seated right. And then he was also like being really nitpicky with his monitor engineer, like, you know, bring this up a little, bring this down a little. Because as anyone who's ever used in-ears knows, the mix in your in-ears matters. It like the the um, the detail to which you need to attend with that mix is far greater than it is when it's just in a wedge in front of you. You can deal with a little bit of sloppiness in the mix in a wedge in front of you uh, that you just can't deal with when it's in your ears. It has to be exactly right. And, um, and that was actually the first thing I noticed was that he was spending a lot of time, you know, kind of queuing to his back and forth to his monitor engineer. And then I saw him like mess with his ears and it's like, Oh, Holy crap. Wait a minute. Like, that's not a motion I've ever seen from that guy before. <laughs> um, and they did four shows. Uh, the third show, I would say, was the was not only the best, and I don't think these two things are unrelated. I think it was the band's best performance of the weekend. It was also the performance where I saw him distracted by these the least. Sunday night show, the fourth and final show, 
was the least connected that I felt the band was. And man, he could not stop messing with him. But I give him a lot of credit because I've I've worked with a lot of different musicians getting people over the hump of of using in ears myself included but but then many many others i mean i've been using them for almost 20 years and worked with people in bands that i'm in and and folks that are listeners and you know other people as well and never once did he rip those things out of his ears and just go you know punt and go back to using his so what you say you're giving him credit for is that he clearly was determined to try and make them work he is determined he stuck with them he stuck with it for four shows and it was obvious especially on sunday night but but even on friday where it was like he was not having a good time because of him he was you know he was stopping to having to play to get it he it seemed like he was having trouble getting it especially his right ear, getting it just settled in his ear. He clearly has a fit problem with his right ear and then also a mix problem. But he, you know, he would stop like playing so that he could like fix his ears. He, he uh, you know, I, I wished, I mean, I wouldn't have done it cause it would have been wholly inappropriate. I would have been ejected, but I wish that I could have gone on stage and been like, okay, dude, like let's get some comply strips. Let's just wrap them around right here and here. Yeah. Let's put them in your ears. Let's get through the gig. And then afterwards we can look at the fit and have whoever made your ears, you know, like, like add, thicken them up or thin them down or wherever, yeah. you know, to, to make it fit. But obviously I, I couldn't do that. I, or I chose not to do that because <laughs> it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have been. But you attempted. Uh, I I just felt so bad for the guy. It was like I've I've been like I've been on stage or been with other people going through this. It's like I think I know what might be able to help. Like I know what to try next at the very least. It was like I just so I'm actually fascinated by this. Can you would you do this and break it down for me? What does me what does it mean when you say you've gotten people for 20 years? You've helped people get over the hump with in ears. What is that process? What are you doing? Because you know, like you and I have spoken about this dozens of times. Yeah. I've had maybe a 10% success rate where I'm comfortable with in ears. And some of it is, you know, some of it is I'm extremely sensitive to the change dynamic changes that happen. And then my, when the mix goes out of whack, that's particularly unnerving to me. Some of it is that I get impatient and I take them out. And then once you kind of feel the room, feel the band, feel the crowd, what you're used to, um, you don't want to go back after, after doing that. Right. Tell, tell me what, what does that mean when you say I've, I've helped people get over the hump? What is, what is your process? Yeah. So the process, the first thing to do is like, if, if, when possible, get a feel for what that person is used to hearing when they stand on stage with monitor wedges, like what, what are you used to coming into this whole process? Because it is a change, right? There's no question that it is going to be different on the other side of this process, right? Uh, but there are benefits. Most of, you know, the biggest one is that you potentially, as long as you don't turn them up too loud, you can save your hearing or save any further damage to your hearing, right? Uh, and then there, and then you might be able to actually hear better on stage too. And, and so those are the two main benefits. But the process is, it starts with, what are you used to hearing? And now let's just get you that. With your in-ears in, perhaps at a lower volume, but maybe not even like let's start with ex let's try and get to exactly what you're used to, which you probably won't want in the end. And usually what that means is maybe starting with them a little louder than you would want to have them in the end, uh, but also starting with a lot of ambient mic bleed. Right. A lot of times, uh, you know, especially working bands like like you or I would be in might not hang ambient mics on the stage to get that stage wash, to get the crowd wash or anything. Touring acts generally do. Uh, but regardless of that, if someone, especially a guitar player who's so used to hearing like their amp from over there, you, you know, uh, but even as a vocalist, you know, you're used to hearing your voice coming from down, you know, down there as opposed to right here in your ears. It's a different thing. So it's let's add some ambient mics, uh, you know, for a drummer, it's easy. You can use the overhead mics of the drums and and that often picks up a lot more, especially in a live setting. If you're tight in, you, you know, like mm -hmm. a club setting or whatever. With a, Again, with a touring band, the overhead mics on the drums might not be picking up guitar amps because they might be, you know, 15 feet away. <laughs> but um, but in a club, especially with ceilings and stuff, you, you know, the overhead mics on the drums are enough. 
sometimes for a guitar player, the overhead mics on the drums are enough. If the guitar player is used to hearing a lot of drums, right? If not, you might need to hang a, an ambient mic. I've had people put them on their mic stand, like clip a mic halfway down on their mic stand. Just something to start picking up that stage wash that you are so accustomed to hearing and blend yeah. and blend a crap ton of that in. Like almost start with that and then add other things. In the end, you'll probably take, you know, 90 percent, if not 100 percent of that stage wash out once you're used to the in-ears, you know. You, and, and so that would be step one is get that, find that. And then step two is I know it's difficult in a performance to mix your own ears, but you know far better than someone else what you want to hear in that moment. And so maybe, you know, having a, a tablet or something somewhere on stage that even between songs, you know, maybe it's every fourth song you have a moment to just sort of, you know, duck back. And and just make those little adjustments for yourself so that you yep. start to get a feel right. I mean, it, 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 obviously, if you're somebody like like we're talking about with Trey Anastasio and a touring act or something or you've got an engineer that can help you, you know, in between those moments. Great. It's not going to hurt. But you having the ability to see it and be like, ah, right. Here's what I'm I now I understand why I'm hearing what I'm hearing. Let me try this little tweak. Oh, OK, that that works better. Certainly sound checks and rehearsals, I would say mandate have some way of controlling it mid performance, you know, so that so that you can you can really start to tweak that and adjust it and find yeah. what you like, you know, and then it also experiment with stereo where, you know, moving, uh, you know, I find with vocals, I like to have me on the left a little bit, maybe 10% left for me and 10% right for all the others, but my levels are equal. So it's not that I'm louder. It's just that I I'm separate a little bit and that's enough, it, you know, but again, like those sorts of things. And, and with, you know, with somebody, you know, I have no idea what it's, what it, what it would normally sound like on stage and what he normally has in his monitors. Does he have drums in his monitors, even though the drummer's right next to him? Uh, yeah. He probably has more keyboards in his monitors than he thinks he does. And I only say that based on watching him. They played one song Sunday night where it's just the keys and him singing and his pitch was, he was, he was not even in the ballpark at, 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 at first. He was just like, it was, he was making it up and it was like, oh, look at that. He can't hear the <laughs> piano. Like, I get it. Like, of course this is now his voice is too loud compared to the instruments. So maybe some compression, uh, you know, on different things to make sure that when it's just guitar or just piano and vocal, that the piano is, is allowed to be louder in those moments. And, and you could use compression to, to allow that to happen sort of without someone needing to ride faders and, and do that for you. But but that's so that's where that to me, that's where I would start is is at a lot of ambient, but find out what it normally sounds like and try and get the ears to approximate that. So because it is a weird thing to be, you know, sealed off from the outside world. So you kind of want to, you know, baby stuff yourself down this path. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then and then EQ and I can't tell you how much I really want it to work and how heartbreaking it is and frustrating it is when it doesn't. Yeah. I watched that frustration. I mean, he was a, he, you know, he's a, he's a professional, right? He, he made it through the gigs, but it was not his best because he was, it was you know, did he have a wedge as well? There were wedges in front of him. I have no idea if they were, you know, lit up or not, um, or yeah. if they were there just for, you know, for emergency backup kind of things, but he, they, he did have wedges in front of him. Um, but, um, yeah, it just felt bad for the guy. It was like, man, I, you know, you need, you need someone. I'm sure he has much people that are much smarter than me, much more experienced than me on his team and he will get there. But, um, but it was, it was just frustrating to watch knowing, yeah. knowing what that process is like. But again, I, I, I was really proud. I was like, man, this is good. Somebody, I, you know, I, who knows what it was. I felt the way he, the, the fact that he never ripped him out kind of made me feel like maybe it was like somebody in his family was like, dude, you must do this. Like you have yeah. to protect your hearing. It, well, it, this is a thing. I mean, you know, again, from so many of the people that we hear from that listen to this show, I mean, it's, it's grownups 
you know, to to very grown ups and your voice and your your ears are on a time schedule for most of us as yep. as we get older and the volume stays the same or gets louder. Um, you, you know, there is a there is a finite shelf life to this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. And and you can you know, you can't undo the damage. Uh, there's some people might argue that you can, but let's for the sake of argument, let's say that that you can't No, what you do is you strategize around the damage and then, you know, risky, you, you know, you're Im- Im- imposing different damage. Yes, yes, exactly. Exactly. And it could be that he has the wrong the wrong in ears too. you know, every you know, as you as you move from vendor to vendor and even model to model amongst a, a given vendor. You know, like when I moved from the Ultimate Ears 7s to the Ultimate Ears 11s, I, I was fine with the 7s. I had made them work. And then I added the and then I went to the 11s and it was like, oh, my gosh, like this is there's a whole other world here. There's a depth here that that, you know, whereas the 7s in retrospect felt like they were inside my head. And now these 11s, it feels like the sounds coming from elsewhere and they, they've got extra drivers in them. I, I don't, it might be the crossover frequencies, wherever those were just for me tends to work better, but I'm not mm-hmm. everybody. And that's sort of the thing is that we're all different. We all have different hearing patterns. We've all suffered different damage up to the point where we start using these things, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. 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 But it was, it was really fascinating to, to watch it first. It was like, does he think, and I asked Lisa, my, you know, my wife was with me. I'm like, you think he's wearing in ears? And she, you know, 10 minutes later, she's like, definitely she's like look at that she's like i've seen you do that i'm like yeah yeah you know like yeah yeah so For poor sure. guy yeah yeah it's good though um that you know the fact that 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 he made it through four gigs with him tells me that he's gonna he's gonna make it to the other side of this hump he's committed which is great which is good that's what it takes it and i you it know I, I think i've said it on this show before i offer i owe a lot of uh gratitude thanks and quite frankly i feel indebted to the folks in route 66 which was the band that i was playing in at the time when i made this transition whatever you know 18 19 20 maybe it was was it 20 years ago it might have been um because they had to put up with me being disconnected like that you know for for a while it took me probably six months to really get to the point where it was like, okay, now I'm comfortable with this. And I came into it having worn earplugs at every gig I ever played ever in my life. So, uh, you know, I was used to having something in my ears. I was used to being disconnected. I was used to the feeling of singing with, with that, that head resonance that, that you get when something's in your ears. And it still took me, you know, a good six months of gigs to be like, okay, now I'm, now this is just normal. Yeah. This is the normal. Yeah, I got to go back in. I really do. I mean, when it's, when it's right, it's heaven and your voice thanks you. Yeah. Although, you know, for singers out there, one of the best pieces of advice I've got is like purely using your hearing to make adjustments to singing is a is a fractured strategy, which sounds funny. But what he's saying is, is that really what a singer does is he's kind of constantly monitoring whether you're in tune, you know, you and your body tells you if you're out of tune, right? Yes. You you hear it and you know it. You, you and so, hope so. You know, being able to kind of like self monitor the vibrations and you know and listen listen kind of to how it feels. That is a big tip. That's a good secret for for singers, you know. And that's a that's a skill that is really valuable to have. And I've seen really good singers sing without monitors and you know still be awesome. Um, you know, you run the risk of pushing you know, to try and get enough yes. of a sensory experience. But, but, you know, that, that's the thing, but on those gigs where, where the stars lined up and I was able to, you just get so much more nuance in your voice. You just get so much more, you know, obviously it's less pushing. And so your voice is my voice on the nights that I've had great in ears. I was, it was like nothing ever happened at the end of a gig and, you know, it was great. Yeah. I really want it to work. It is so disorienting the process of it not working though. I mean, it is so, you know, disorienting is the right word. I remember I, and I hadn't thought about this until this weekend when I, you know, sort of re-experienced it from afar, you know, that there was one gig probably, you know, within the first month, maybe six weeks of me, you know, really using in-ears where I remember playing, I, I happened to be singing lead on this one tune 
It was the, the Beatles, all my loving. And I remember it only because I'll never forget where all of a sudden I didn't know who in the band was playing what part. We had two guitar players in the band, um, a keyboard player, a bass player and me. And suddenly I, I just got this disoriented thing because it, everything was not spatially oriented. You know, like I can't turn my head and see that guy and know that the sound I'm hearing is him. And it was just like, oh, my God, what's going on here? Yeah. This is like this is so weird. And and I got through the tune, but I remember at the end of the tune being like, what have I done? I don't what did I do to my mix to get myself here? And I never want to ever be here again. And uh, and t to this day, I'm not quite sure what it was. I I may have added some reverb or something to make it feel more spacious, uh, you know, and it was like, no, no, Dave, no, that's too much. You know, don't Well, talking about that kind of how to self monitor. I had an experience a year ago where I had a terrible flu on stage. My body was not right. My ears were clogged and they were ringing. And I, you know, my body was wrong. I had a 105 degree fever. Didn't know it at the time. I was in a bad way. I could not self-regulate and find pitch. I just literally, I, I couldn't, I couldn't hear it well enough. I couldn't feel it well enough in order to make any adjustments at all. It was just, Oh, it was it was an yeah. out of body experience how bad it was and how wrong it was and like Nick was looking at me like do you hear yourself and I was like no I, I don't yeah I, well <laughs> I, I hear that it's wrong but as I'm emoting the sound the, the usual controls I have in my body you know the monitoring system in my body it ain't working man so it was a it was a weird thing it, the one thing hey, that that's good. that's interesting about in ears that it, one last piece of advice I'll share for anybody that's that's moving to them that was not using them prior, which is I think most people. Although I I like to believe that there's some kids out there that maybe they're spoiled. I don't know, but maybe in a good way. Then they have in ears. But anyway, those of us that that have to make the jump to them, singing is an interesting thing because singing in a rock band you. In order to be successful at it, you naturally learn how to project into a microphone and and project in a way that makes your voice sort of leap out of the speakers. Right. You, you, you learn how to make that happen. Hopefully you do it in a way that's OK for your voice and all of that stuff. As soon as you move to in-ears, though, you no longer in order to hear yourself. You no longer need to project. In fact, the opposite is often true. You can hear your breath sounds. You can hear all the little sibilants and nuances. And you have to remember that the speakers that are, you know, reinforcing your sound to the audience have not changed one bit. So all the projection that you needed to do in the past, you still need to do to make sure that your voice sounds good coming out of those speakers. And that's a really difficult thing. And it often means turning. So maybe this is one other piece of advice for sort of the, the generic advice that I gave before. Turning yourself down, turning your vocal down in your ears so that you do have to not over push, but you have to still project at a normal level to make that microphone work and to make those speakers work and do what they are supposed to do for you. So just sure. bear that in mind. Because because it, you can get yourself into trouble with it. And, you know, I'm raising my hand here speaking from personal experience. So, yeah, uh, there you go. Hey, Hi. I wanted to share um, I have a rehearsal tonight and we haven't had a rehearsal for a while. And, you know, I've changed the process of the House Rockers rehearsal flow for 20 years. We rehearse from January to May pretty much every week. It's every Tuesday night, you know, and that's the thing. Sure. And uh I tell the guys what to, what we're going to work on, you know, and it's usually adding new material or, you know, smoothing over stuff that's not quite right or, you know, whatever, whatever problems we need to fix it, you know, it doesn't work out to be every week. You know, there's guys who need to take a week off who go out of town or stuff like that. So, but it's fairly consistently two or three Tuesday nights a month between Jan Jan January and May. And that is kind of forms our plan for the quote unquote new show we do every summer when we, when we play a lot. Sure. Um, this year, I think I shared a couple episodes ago, we played a corporate gig and the audience was largely 24 to 34, overwhelmingly. And when we sat down for our first rehearsal this year, we had a couple of new songs that we started to go through and we went through, but it was kind of the same repertoire choices that we have. It was a Beatles song, a Huey Lewis song, you know, a, a classic funk song. 
And I asked the guys, I said, you know, we're about to go through this process where we're going to add new songs. What do you guys think that, you know, why don't we just fill out a repertoire and have more stuff that will enable us to connect with more, you guys want more wedding gigs and more corporate gigs. You know, should we spend the time? Is it smart? And instead of adding more of what we have, because we've got a couple hundred songs now, should we fill in this deficit we have? And the usual discussion about, well, is that who we are? And, you know, we'll be able to do it. And, you know, should we add a girl singer? And, you know, these, there's a lot of production to these songs that kind of came and went, but we agree that we're going to spend the time doing it. But the big thing that we're changing this year, and tonight's going to be the first uh, go at it is we haven't rehearsed in a month. And I gave the guys a set of material to come and be ready to play a full set. So rather than the two or three songs a week that we might do go away for a month, Here's the set. They've known it for a month. Come ready to, to blast this stuff out. And, you know, you know, as an experienced band member of a musician, that there is a whole bunch of rationale checklists that go on. Well, we're not performing it this weekend, so I don't have to have it perfect this weekend, right? We've got some more time. We've got some more rehearsal scheduled. This is good enough for now. You know, even if I set the expectations, we want to get through this material as quickly as possible. You know, come ready, come performance ready. You know, I think people know that some of these songs are not going to get done in one rehearsal anyway. You know, they're more nuanced than that and they're more complex than that. It's going to take a couple of rehearsals. Sure. So this will this will get me into the rehearsal. I won't stick out for being the 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 least prepared. I might not be the most prepared, but I'm ready to go. And that that's what I'm saying. That little rationale box many musicians and me included draw for ourselves as to what's good enough to get to the, yeah, what can to, I, what, again, what are, this is, what's the MVP, the minimum minimum viable product that I need to bring to this exactly. rehearsal so that, yeah, like you said, I can participate, I can support the other band members and I can learn what it is that I need to continue to refine for that particular song. I think. And some of the rationales are actually really well founded. Like I need to hear how someone else is going to handle this part before I figure out I'm going to do, I know what has to happen there, but I, we need to make sure everybody heard this change in a certain way. Yeah. You know, well, or see, I know Paul, he'll want to extend this part and that type of thing. And that's good. That's, that is. So, so those, those arguments, those memes that go around that rehearsals are not for learning songs, learn them on your own. I mean, there's, there's degrees of truth to that, right? Exactly. So, you know, you're putting together songs in rehearsal, but you have to know what you're putting together. If, if you don't understand the basic, you know, melody, harmony, chord structure, time, rhythm, you know, don't be that guy who comes completely unprepared, assuming that I'll just pick it up. But um, anyway, we're, we're going to learn a set of music. I think the, the way I think about that is I need to walk in knowing it, it, many things, but the most important one is how does it go? Right. How what's the flow of the song? Could I walk us through? Could I play this song on my own without any other band members? Now, that that doesn't mean that whatever I would play on my own, therefore, is my way or the highway. Like you need to come into rehearsal and do all the things that you said where like that. you're going to you're going to manipulate and, and tweak and change. But, you know, I feel like you need to come in and you need to know the song. And if you're using charts, OK, fine. Then you rely on your charts. If you're not, then you don't rely on your charts and you rely on your memory. Uh, but, you know, you come in and you know the song. You're not reliant on if I don't hear the, you know, the the bass player play that change. Now I'm lost. No, no. Like you need to know that the bass player should have played that change because even once you've been playing the song for a year, something might happen. Say the bass player's messing with his in-ears. You know, you don't know. Now suddenly the bass player doesn't hit that change. You got to know that he missed it and play your part anyway and vice versa. When you miss something, the band needs to to keep plowing forward. I I feel like that's one of those things I learned from watching Rush over the years because that music is impossible to play if anybody on stage is lost, right? Everybody needs to know. You can't catch up. You can't catch up. You need to know, okay, that guy just screwed up. We're all aware that that guy just screwed up, except maybe that guy's not aware. And therefore, we might have to just follow that guy. Because if he's not aware that he screwed up, he might very well be right. You know, in his mind, right? As I always say, as a consensus, not an absolute uh, when you're playing live. Uh, you know, those kinds of things. So you need to know, like you need to come in knowing your part cold, even yeah. if it's going to change. 
And you need to kind of expect it to change, but you got to come in with that baseline of, okay, here's what, here's what I can do. And, and then let's see what the other guys came up with. And and then let's morph it into our song or our That's rendition right. of that song. Yeah. But first you got to get your hands around it, right? You, you don't go in. It. Yeah. Yeah. It would be somewhat lazy thinking to say my lack of preparation is because we're going to make it our own, you know, you know, you, you're covering something. So you're starting from a, you're starting from a familiar point for everybody. And, and this is, you know, even just with, my own even personal with originals. I do this like it's you got to come in knowing the song, even if it's going to change. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it's just a, it's a little easier with originals because, it, well, it can be if everyone is involved in either the songwriting or song arranging process at that stage. But sometimes that's not the case. It's like, hey, I have this song. I wrote this song. Let's go play it. And and now you got to learn the song just like it's covered. I mean, it's just a yeah. song. Yeah. Yeah. So the other thing that's different is when we were doing two or three songs a week, the vocalists would get there early and we would start working on the harmonies for things. And harmonies just take us a little bit longer. It certainly takes me longer. Um, it takes a lot of repetition. So we, you know, we would do that. So tonight it's really just to make sure guys have learned the part and the form is there. Get a sense for which songs are going to work and which songs you know, our, our red flag that, you know, for our instrumentation, we bit off a little bit more than, than we might want to go for, right? What songs are going to take a lot of work? What songs are going to take, you know, what songs can we just kind of like sure. blast out? So one of the songs we're doing tonight is Stacy's mom. I know you love fountains of Wayne, right? <laughs> She's got it going on that most people, on. most people mistake that as a bowling for soup song so much so right. that bowling for soup started just playing it in their live sets. But which is kind of fun. So that's one tonight. We added horns to it. And that's one, except for the background vocals. I think, you know, from a band standpoint, we should be able to get pretty close tonight. And one, one other one we're doing is Timberlake's suit and tie, which is like this very produced, very, you know, very modern sounding song. That's going to take some time. So we have a combination of those things. So the goal tonight is to play through the set. The lead vocalist has got to know his stuff and, you know, kind of get us through, sure. not expect background vocals. If someone happens to be ready on background vocals, go ahead and add them in. Not We make sure that the horn charts line up, that we're all on the same page about forms. We take so much of what we do from live versions of songs. And it's uh, it's funny, you, you know, once the conversation starts to say, well, here's a live version, someone adds you know, oh, here's another live version where you can hear that section better. Better once there's two versions of something floating out there, you're kind of screwed. You got to really be on top of keeping everybody on the same page in terms of you know because it grows into you know different stretch parts and you know different different things happening. Keeping everybody to the same form is is one of the one of the the goals. And so tonight we're going to play a set. Basically, we're going to spend the next couple of months perfecting a set. There's a couple more that we're going to add that weren't in for this first um, uh, uh, chunk. Some horn charts. Most of the horn charts are ready. Some of them are not ready. So just the rhythm section will have those ready. Sure. So we're in this different kind of process. And it'll be interesting. Like, you know, again, I know my guys. I know, you know, they're the guy. Uh, my guys are really actually quite good. I can say that we don't have much. Re- rehearsals where someone sticks out. I mean, I think nobody wants to be that guy that they didn't do their homework. This is a lot though. This is, uh, you know, 11 songs. Half of them are, are pretty involved um, in terms of finding parts to play. There hasn't been a lot of back and forth on our Slack. Like I'm going to play this. What are you going to play this? So I'm really interested to see, you know, parts that could be covered by a key or could be covered by a guitar or something like that. There hasn't been a lot of discussion so I'm interested to see tonight whether that's because people made a firm determination. I'm just going to play this uh, or we'll work it out in rehearsal, you know, whether there'll be that type of discussion. So anyway, I'm looking forward to it. It's a lot of cool stuff. It's more modern music. I do want to share with you a little bit of the, of the list of stuff we're going through. Um, and, and again, we're talking about the impetus was this was, uh, was a recognition that we didn't have a full show of music for you know what would be a lot of the corporate work around here or certainly a lot of the younger wedding work around here so the goal is kind of like get last you know 10 to 15 you know 2000 and would be the absolute minimum but most of it is newer than that so we're doing uh and the other part of that is when attacking this music how do you not look like a bunch of old guys playing young music especially if it's female lead vocal cover music how do you 
how do you create a vibe around the music that's kind of true to who your band is and doesn't look like the kind of stereotypical lounge band, wedding band that kind of homogenizes everything that really, you know, really kind of digs in and finds the beauty and the thing that makes a hit song a hit song. How do you do that and still kind of be true to the musical identity that your band has? That makes sense? It does. I think you, you just need to try out these tunes because you'll find that some of the, you know, you'll look, looking at the list, you would say, all right, those 10 songs are not us. Right. But then when you go and play through them, yeah. you might find that four, maybe six, maybe even eight of those songs are like, Hey, you know what? We played this. This works for us. Like we can deliver this, this, you know, we sound good delivering it. We, we feel good delivering it. It's fun to play some. You got to find something in the in the song that you can sort of hang your hat on. Right. And, and maybe right. it's wow. When we play this, you know, look how much fun everybody's having like that. That's enough. It, and I again, you know, this is this also happens in original projects. There was a, a song I've mentioned on this show before called China Buddha Fat Man. That uh, yeah. that we played in Go Figure, you know, back when I was in college, it was an original song of ours. Uh, no one that's listening here has ever heard it, except maybe like four of you. Uh, but it was like one of our biggest hits. I hated this song every mm. single time we played it. And one of you was was there in the crowd many of those times and heard me say that like three years ago on this show. And said, I had no idea. Like, that song was one of your hits. I'm like, oh, I know. That's why we played it every night. Like, everybody else in the band liked it. I just thought it was stupid. So, uh, but, but it, you know, that's me. It went over. But it went over, and people loved it. And it was, it was, you know, it got to the point where it was just fun to play, even though yep. I wouldn't have chosen to listen to it. And it was like, you know what? That's, that's fine. It's great. It's all good. And uh, but you got to you got to find whatever that is in your songs that you're going to play. You got to find that. And there will be some if that list of 10. It might be half of it. It hopefully is less than half of that list where you play through it once and you're like, OK, so the time we spent learning this is uh, just, you know, honing our craft and perfecting our uh, our our approach to our instruments. But don't worry, we won't ever play that song again in this band, you know, and, and that's fine. Like you, you figure fine. those Here's things out. Here's the list. go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Sucker by the Jonas Brothers. Oh, that's a great and song. Yeah. Do you, in, as I'm saying these, tell me if you play any of them in, um, in Uptown, right? Mm. All right. Sucker by the Jonas Brothers. Cake by the Ocean by the Sword of jo- Jonas Brothers. Uh, uh, yeah, that's a great song. Yep. The, 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 uh, Shape sort of, of you. the Sword of Jonas Brothers. That's, that's a good way of putting it. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Shape of You by Sharon. And uh, I'm actually excited about that one because I can actually, that's one of those ones where I can hear an arrangement that would fit our band and the dynamics of our band. So I, I'm Cake actually, by the Ocean will be one of those songs for you too, I predict. Oh, I, cool. I, it's a fun one to play for sure. Yeah. All right. We started with that Billy Eilish bad guy. First time out, we played it. It was not quite ready, but we had a gig in front of a pretty young crowd. And so we brought it out and they loved it just here in the riff. That's but, great. you know, I didn't, we didn't quite get there. And so everybody's like, you know, we got to fix this thing. All right. Uh, Stacy's mom. Uh, another Sheeran song, Castle on the Hill. Uh, American Authors, Best Day of My Life. I love that song. I love songs where the it's call and response with the audience. So, yep. And that's a very just different vibe. Like it's it. not a you know standard funk type thing. It's one that you got to sell a little bit. And you got to perform it, but it's really fun. And then uh, Can't Stop the Feeling was that huge Timberlake hit. Oh, yeah. You play that in Uptown? No, we don't. Um, and, and as soon as you said it, it was like, I wonder why we don't. You know, I don't really control that set list. So, um, so I mean, I, I can suggest things, but it's Gary that runs that that sure. particular song list. But yeah, that one would make a lot of sense for that band. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And then Suit and Tie. So that's okay. a Timberlake one. Yeah. Finesse is a Bruno Mars one. Yeah. And then one of our big project songs for this winter is that um, Jesse J, Ariana Grande, Bang Bang. Oh, wow. Huh. Yeah. All right. So yeah. how a bunch of guys are going to tackle that. Nick's excited. That Nick will sing that. He's excited about it. That's good. You know, it's kind of nasty and funky and that type of thing. And no, that, that's you guys his... will find your own way through that, I think, too. I think that one will work nicely. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. So that's that's the plan for this year so far. We're going to run the whole thing tonight. Cool. And uh, yeah. I look forward hey, before to hearing we're it, done for this week. Yes. What's that? I, I look forward to hearing how it goes. Like I look like, yeah. forward to your report. Yeah, man. Hey, before we're done for this week, I did want to kind of share one last thing. You know, okay. we've been kind of tr- tracking this AB5 stuff. And, you know, I, I know 
to remind everyone, it's a California thing that occasionally or possibly may affect more than just California. And it's the concept that musicians, uh, their status as independent contractors and whether band leaders or whether bands have to have formal business entities or band leaders have to have formal business entities and payroll, you know, people and whether venues have to make bands employees. That's that what we've been talking about here. I did want to share that, um, you know, there's a vote in California on Thursday where someone has submitted an idea to, to repeal the whole thing because it's just bad law that is so vague and is making everybody. I mean, you know, technically, high school baseball coaches are contractors now. They would not be contractors, right? You know, well, high, what will high schools do? Well, they're going to put a part time dad on a on the payroll in order to in order to to uh, contract with them to have a baseball team. That Probably would be not. Way, that would be way easier for them though because they've already got a payroll structure in place. I, I mean, yeah. there, there's probably some liabilities that they would prefer not to absorb with that. But but they've like much different than a band that now needs to. But you get my this. point. I do it, get it, your it, point. It's, like, it's a headache. Yeah. There are many, 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 many people who are independent contractors in many, many disciplines, musicians being one of them. Anyway, this week, interestingly enough. So, so there's a, a, a possible vote on Thursday to repeal the whole thing. Okay. I hear. I've heard, yes, we've you know created enough noise and enough momentum in the community that the, that 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 repeal bill is going to happen. I've heard there's no way a repeal bill is going to is even going to get to the floor. I mean, there's all so nobody sure. really knows. What's nobody happening, knows. Right. right. But I w- did want to share that I've talked to two um, great, prosperous, hardworking, constantly working corporate bands that are in California and um, two different parts of California. One guy assured me that he has it on great authority from their, 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 the band is a business and, and, uh, uh, but they don't, they don't, um, W2 employee band members, they, they 1099 them. Okay. But the band itself is a, is a business entity that they've been informed by legal counsel that there's no way this bill is going to stay around and it's going to get repealed. And, you know, they know this, right? Uh-huh. I also heard <laughs> from another band who the guy who owns the band is a very, very successful business band. And, uh, you know, he has this band and he's like, well, we're not messing around with this. There's too much chance and too much risk in here. Yeah. Um, basically, you all, the good thing is there, I have my attorneys give me the interpretation that, if each band member goes out and establishes themselves as a business, gets a business license and a tax ID number, doesn't have to be. And again, let's offer the disclaimer. We, you and I, Gig Gab, Paul and Dave are not lawyers. I'm sh- simply sharing, yep. you know, r- rhetorical information um, that uh, this guy, you know, he hires musicians to play in his band and, and you know, hire, he puts on a festival. He is requiring anyone that he contracts that they can keep their independent status, but they have to have a federal tax ID number and they have to um, uh, get a business license. Okay. So not, and, not just a, a social security number. They need a, a business tax ID, right? Like it, like an LLC or a partnership or whatever they want to form. Yeah. I think you can get a federal tax ID, even if you're a sole proprietorship. Oh, that's, that's true. You can. That's what I read. That, no, you're totally and, right about so, that. Yes, that's right. What he said is that it makes your schedule seem more defensible, all the type it of does. stuff. But yep. the point of all this is here's two very successful bands that have gone to their council yep. <laughs> and have come up with drastically different yeah. interpretations about how this is going to play out. That's how messed up this the is. The first one is very much wishful thinking. There's no way that that any attorney could know that a an in place law is not going to be enforced like right. it, like they might have gotten they might they might you know have lunch with the 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 district attorney or whoever like whatever it works out to be like somebody says no we're not going to waste our time with that today like yet we haven't but like you, you cannot predict the future so that's a little that's bit right. of wishful thinking it might turn out to be correct but you cannot predict the future the law is written and is in the books uh you know that's uh, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Well, I hope I, I'm curious to see what happens on Thursday. So now we have two things to follow up on next week. So there here we go. go. All right. Well, that gets us out of here. That's good stuff, man. Yeah. Let's uh, I hope you're I hope you're I'm going back to really the well. Here, brother. I, I really got to make that work. Yeah. Well, we'll get you there. But we'll, we're all behind you and, and I will. I'll do whatever I can to get you there. So, yeah, it's good. Take it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you got to always be performing. And, that's and what I hear. That's the thing. That's the thing. Always. 
Your in-ears make always last longer. <laughs> <laughs> See you next week, folks. Feedback Please. at gigabpodcast.com. 